graphics, we got some more uh, stories dealing with Elisha specifically. Um, last week, of course, was the story of Naaman the Syrian being healed, and that's what the entire chapter is about. This week, we got a few different things going on. Let's just jump right in here. Verse number one, the Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Now that word straight just basically means it's narrow. So um, they go to Elisha, the sons of the prophets he's dwelling with, and they're saying, hey, they're, basically what they're saying is there's not enough room for us. Right? There's, there's enough of us here. We've got enough stuff going on. We need a bigger space. We need a bigger place because we're, we're, we're all on top of each other right here. So in verse 2, it says, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam. And let us make, a, make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. So they're saying, Hey, you know, we want to go and just build a new home, build a new place to stay, a bigger place, somewhere where we're gonna, all going to have enough room, we're not going to be on top of each other. And they say, Look, let us go. So he's like, Go ahead. He says, Go ye. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. And with the, basically with the attention that Elisha was content right where he was. He was fine with what God had given him. He's not worried about being on top of each other, saying, no, I'm doing a work for the Lord or whatever. You know, he's doing what he's doing. They want to go. You want to go and, and get carried off into whatever else? Go ahead. And then in verse 3, it says, And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So then one of them's like, No, come, you know, come with us. Go to this other place with us. So they invite him along to go with them, and he goes with them. Verse number four says, So he went with them, and, they, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. The man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and, put it, and he put out his hand and took it. I love this little story. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't know, like, I, I don't even know if I feel like I know the primary reason why the story's in here. It's a cool little miracle that, that Elisha does. But one of the things I notice that people do with, with stories like this is I think they go a little bit too far trying to find, like, some physical reason of how this could have happened. You know, it's, it's a similar thing that happened with Jacob. When God blessed Jacob after he worked for those 14 years, and he worked for another seven years, he worked for like 20 years for Laban, and his wages were changed 10 times, and he didn't get what he was worth and everything, and at the end, God finally blessed him. And when the, when the cattle were, were um, breeding, you know, he put in, when they would go to the trough or go to drink, he would put those reeds down before them, you know, before the strong ones, and then he'd take them away. And, you know, I've heard people trying to say that there's something in the reeds or something, you know, I don't think that's the case. When, when I preach through the book of Genesis, it says that he saw these things in a dream. So he knew what to do, and he was just kind of following what the Lord was instructing him to do. But I, don't, I still think that that was God blessing him, that it didn't really have anything to do with the physical nature of the reeds or anything like that, that he was just being obedient and doing, you know, basically doing what God had him to do, and God was blessing him for all the hard work they did and making sure that he was being recompensed for the work that he had done. Because God makes sure when you put in, you know, you put in hard work, he'll make sure you get rewarded for that. That we don't need to worry about avenging ourselves or, you know, doing everything to make sure that we're getting paid, you know, people going on strike and doing all these other things. And I think it's wicked. I mean, you agree to work for somebody, you do the work you agreed to do. You don't just start picking up signs because you're getting discontent with your wages and other people, well, they're making more and everything else. So I'm just going to go ahead and just strike. You ought to be thankful you got a job to begin with. You just do the work that you got to do. God will see the work that you're doing. If you're working with all of your heart as unto the Lord, God's going to make sure that you're taken care of. And there's no, no doubt about that whatsoever. And, you know, if everyone had that type of an attitude, the company would probably be doing way better anyways in order to, to give more to the employees. But it's when people want to do the, the bare minimum and get paid the maximum is when you got a problem. But anyways, that's getting off on a whole other subject. The reason why I even brought up Jacob with the, you know, with the cattle and being blessed with that is I think it's a similar type of a miracle where this, this is nonetheless a miracle. I mean, just like Moses you know, taking his rod and striking the rock where the waters came out. It's not the special rod. 
It's not that he had the right type of wood. It's not that it was the right type of rock. It was a miracle that God performed, that God had prepared these things. And in the same way here, we've got, you know, this guy's cutting down an, you know, some wood. He's made, creating a beam out of wood. He's using a hatchet. And then the ax head goes flying off as he's, as he's chopping the wood and it falls into the river. And he's like, alas, master. You're like, what am I going to do? Because he borrowed it. It wasn't his. So, of course, he goes to the man of God. The man of God helps him. He's like, okay, well, where, where did it fall? So he breaks, you know, cuts down a stick, throws it in at the, you know, where the, the place where the, the axe head was. And about, I love the word it says, and, and, it, and the iron did swim. The iron. It just swims up to the top. And he's like, okay, we'll go grab it. And then that was it. And that's, this is like the end of this little story, this little section of scripture here. Just kind of closes out that story. I think it's real neat. Um, just kind of on another point. Notice it says the iron did swim. And this was, I was doing research for something, for a future study in the Second Kings. Because I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get ahead on, on some of the, with, with some extra biblical history of what just historical events from different nations and the wars that were going on at that time. And as I was studying and reading, they, 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 you'd be surprised at how flimsy a lot of history actually is. And it's funny because the people who want to scoff at the Bible and stuff, they'll exalt all the, you know, the history of these, these ancient uh, empires and what, you know, the Syrians, the Assyrians, the, the Babylonians and stuff. You know, there's, there's written records of stuff. Of course, there's history. But a lot of times, you know, the scrutiny that they give the Bible is nothing like the scrutiny they give these other texts because a lot of them hate the Bible and they want to just go about any method they can to disprove the Bible. But any, in any case, one of the things that they mention there is, um, who, who's heard, do you know, what the, like the Bronze Age? And the, the Iron Age and all this other stuff, it's a bunch of garbage. It, it, it follows along, it's like we're talking to that guy today, it follows along that same thinking of, well, man came from ape, and you have this primitive man, you know, slowly getting more, you know, evolved and, and learning more things and, you know, getting new tools and stuff. And it's like, it's a bunch of crap. It really is a bunch of nonsense. Don't buy, in, don't, don't buy into that stuff. You can look it up. And again, I'm, I don't have all the information at the top of my head right now. I read all about that years and years ago. Uh, for one, I was taught their, you know, their stupid theories. But then the reasons why, I forget all the reasons why in their archaeological digs. Oh, well, up to this point, they only had these tools because of whatever they were using. It's not because they didn't know about iron. They didn't know about these things. They knew about them. Is there's, there's faulty in the, there's, it's fault in their, um, in their archaeology. But anyways, and, it, and it's in their preconceived idea that man has just, you know, started off as a, as a Neanderthal, as a, you know, as, a, as a, an ape that learns how to, use, how to use a hammer and chisel and make a wheel, like the Flintstones or something. And that's their, uh, their technology. But the Bible tells us a lot about even technology that they had way back in early days that um, supposedly wasn't invented yet. The Bible talks about engines. The Bible talks about things that they had that was, um, it's actually really cool. And the reason why is because people have always had the same mental capacity. People, people, God's given us you know, ingenuity and, and innovation and, and, and it's just a matter of what, where your, you know, your um, technology leads you and where the needs are at and stuff. And now, yeah, of course, you gain more knowledge and wisdom as information is passed down from generation to generation, and there's, there's certain areas you can learn more about. But the technology at the time, a guy we we're talking about today, you know, say, well, what about the pyramids? How could they have been done? Well, they had different technology. I mean, they were, they were able to do that, obviously. You don't need to have some solution like aliens did it because you don't know how they would do it today without using cranes because our mindset is, well, this is what we're using and we weren't able to use these things before. Well, if you didn't have those resources at your fingertips, you'd find another way to do it. You'd find another way to leverage weight and to, you know, and to, and to make other very ingenious devices to help you do the work that you need to get done in the environment that you're in. I mean, now, nowadays, think about, think about what life would, like, would, would be like without a refrigerator. 
I mean, everything we do, like, that's going to spoil. You can't leave any food out for any length of time because everything's going to spoil and everything's going to go bad. Well, what did people do for thousands of years without refrigeration? Somehow they survived. Somehow they still were able to keep food and make it last and eat and drink and everything else. But it's just things change and, you know, with the, the tools that you use, you, you hone on, you improve them. I mean, we've got sent, you know, and I'm not, you know, downing technology at all. It's just different. It's just different things where we've gone. There's technologies, I believe, that's, that are just gone and, and the information's just gone about them that we would look at and be like, wow, that's amazing. We probably have some other way of handling this, you know, a, a different solution for the same problem using different technology. But it doesn't make it any less, you know, cool or sophisticated or anything like that. And the reason why I bring it up is because he was using iron here. And this time period that I was looking at, they're, they're saying like, oh, this might be the beginning of the Iron Age or the, you know, it's like, it's nonsense. In any case, let's keep reading here. Verse number eight. I don't want to spend too much time on that, that little story because there's other more important points that I think we could find in this chapter. Verse number eight, the Bible says, then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servant saying, in such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. So basically what's happening is that Syria and Israel are at war with each other. And the king of Syria, he, he, you know, he's making his battle plans and he's putting his troops in position in different places and he's making ambushments or whatever he's trying to do. And Elisha's sending to the king of Israel saying, Hey, king of Syria is down there. Don't go there. Right? King of Syria is over here. Don't go there. It says not once nor twice, so it's probably at least three times that Elisha's you know, telling the king of Israel what the king of Syria is doing. Why? Because Elisha's a man of God, and God was giving him the revelation of what is going on there. And that's why the king of Syria, he's, he's discouraged because he's just like, man, everything we try to do is being foiled. There must be a spy. And that's why he's saying, who is for the king of Israel? Tell me now, which, which one of you is leaking this information because there's no way that he should know about any of this. And they're like, look, we're all with you and it's none of us. It's Elisha. And even they recognize that, it, that Elisha had the, you know, was, a, was a man of God, that he had this type of insight. And you know, one thing I think that's kind of interesting there is you know, if, if there's a, you, when you truly have a man of God, he's going to be warning you from the dangers to come. He's going to warn you from the snares, from the traps and things like that. And it's good to listen to the man of God. You know, so many people these days they get this mindset of, oh, I don't want to follow any man. Well, hold on a second. Now, we should be following Jesus Christ in the Bible. Absolutely. But there are definitely men worthy of following and getting instruction from also. The man of God is someone, you know, God uses man to give the instruction, to provide information, provide things. You know, we're not the Catholic Church that says you could only get understanding from the priest or from the Pope or whatever, from a God man. But the man of God, someone who has wisdom and knowledge from Scripture, is someone that is someone that you, you should be going to and getting instruction from to help you avoid snares and traps and problems and things in your life. Because in this case, it's a physical battle, it's a physical war. But in our case, we're fighting a spiritual war. And there's a lot of snares, there's a lot of traps out there that the devil's trying to get you caught up in, that, that people who hate God are trying to get you caught up in, and that if you've got somebody that's a, that's a good man of God that has wisdom and knowledge, they're going to help you to avoid those things. But you've got to be able to listen and hear and be humble and be able to receive instruction. But too many people, I think, these days are so lifted up. They say, oh, I don't need any man. I don't need anybody to tell me. Now, look, we don't have to. We could learn things without a man, but God gave teachers and apostles and prophets and, you know, 
gave gifts to people in order to help you to succeed. Because let's face it, we all could use instruction. And it's, you know, while you ought to be learning on your own, it's also extremely valuable to be finding someone who has wisdom, has knowledge, who is following Christ and follow the example that they're setting forth also. I mean, I, I've preached entire sermons about that. I'll probably be preaching something like that coming up too because it is important. It is important to have good role models and good examples and to identify someone, hey, there's someone following Christ and I'm going to follow their example. And I'm going to listen and, and take heed to instruction. doesn't mean you have to agree with every single thing that comes out of their mouth. But someone who has a lot of wisdom and knowledge from Scripture is a good person to listen to. Because they're going to help you to avoid the snares and the traps and the ambushes that are being set up. The dangers and the pitfalls to watch out for in this life. Because there's a lot of them out there. A lot of deception. So the king of Syria doesn't know what's going on because every time he fails. And the king of Israel, man, he's got to be loving this. He's getting the inside info, man. He's... he's he, you know, the first time he hears about it, he's like, he sends people down to be like, is this really the case? So he sent people down. Sure enough, there's the king of Syria. So he knows exactly where he's at, not once nor twice. So at least three times he's, he's been avoiding all of these traps. He's listening to the man of God. Look what happens here. Um, so a king of Israel, uh, um, the king of Syria finds out, you know, his, his counselors are telling him, look, it's Elisha. He's your problem. It's not us. It's him. Verse 13, and he said, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. So Elisha is living in the city, Dothan. And the king of Syria, Syria sends like a whole army. This great host. He's got horses and chariots and they come, and they creep in at night and they just surround the place. They surround where Elisha is. Scary thing. Verse number 15. But look at the attention that one man's getting. One man of God is drawing an army after him. You'd think he'd just send a few people down there, or, you know, a few guys. No, he's causing them that much problems. He's like, we're not going to let this guy go. We're going to send a whole army to get one man. Verse number 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So his servant rises up early and he sees, what in the world? You're like, Where did all these people come from? What are we going to do? Master, what are we going to do? Elisha, what are we going to do? And look at Elisha's attitude, verse 16. And he answered, Fear not. He said, Don't be afraid. Hey, don't be afraid when you see the enemy all around you. Don't be afraid when they've got the horses and the chariots and you're completely outnumbered. Don't be afraid. An instance where most people would be afraid. Because there's no way we, we can't run away. There's nowhere to go. They've got me surrounded. What are they going to do to me? Are they going to torture me? Are they going to kill me? What's going on? Fear not. Man, I love these stories of Elisha. The boldness. The faith. Fear not. Look at what he says. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Here's Elisha and his servant in this city, surrounded by horses and chariots. Great host. You know what? People on our side, there's a lot more of, of us than them. That's why you don't have to be afraid. Verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You know what's great about this story? I don't believe that Elisha saw the horses and the chariots physically with his own eyes. I don't think that he was watching these things out there. I think Elisha just had the faith, and he knew that they're there. And he knew that God's protecting him. And he knows that he's doing what's right and that he has nothing to fear from anything in this world. And that God is going to look over and protect them. And he just says, God, you know, open up his eyes. Let him see what no one else can see. Let him see that you're here with us. And God answered his prayer and opened up his eyes. 
Imagine what a sight that would be. You know what's cool about this story also? This is the word of God. This is true. This really, this isn't some fable. This isn't some ghost story. This isn't some, some, some fiction that's just made up. This is real. This is reality. This exists. We need to remember that there is a spirit world out there. Again, this is another topic. That came, it was a crazy day out soul winning, but we had all kinds of conversations from aliens to devils and all kinds of stuff. So, but um, the spirit world's real. This event literally happened. It's not just some story. Just like Elijah was taken to heaven by the, by the flaming chariots and horses, right? He was caught up in a whirlwind in the heaven and the angels took him with, by that chariot with the horses. It's the same thing that they have now surrounding and protecting them. These angels, the, you know, the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire round about them, in, in, in camping about them and protecting them. Now the reality of the spirit world, when we see this, this is one reason to stay away from witchcraft and things that delve into the spirit world and things that they have to do where you're, you're getting into this mysticism and the Ouija boards, right? Where you're trying to contact the dead and open up doors into the spirit world. You get the satanic Bible and you start doing all these, these rituals and things, you know, the black magic, white magic, all that garbage. You know, there's a reason why God tells us in the Bible not to do that stuff. Deuteronomy 18, you could turn there if you'd like. I was going to read you some passages from there that just, where the Bible is very explicit on staying away from all that garbage. And the reason why is because this stuff is real. Now look, I know there's a lot of charlatans out there. I know you've got a lot of phonies. I know you've got people who say they could, they have ESP, they could read minds, and they say they're psychics and stuff. And all they're really good at is picking up on clues about people, and, and they know statistics, and they know things that they could say that are real generic, and they don't really have any powers at all, and it's just a big sham. I get it. I know that that's real. But I also know that there are people that do, you know, go to communicate with spirits, and have familiar spirits that the Bible talks about, and that that is real. And I know that people get demon-possessed in this world. I know there is possession. I know there are people that open up doors into areas of things that you ought not to be getting involved with. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, the Bible reads, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. All these different terms, subtly different in meaning, they have slightly different variations of the meaning, but it's all dealing with the same thing. It's all dealing ultimately with this witchcraft, and with this dealing with the dead, and with the spirit world, and those types of things. And the Bible says not to have anything to do with it. Why? Verse 12, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. The Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. See, what people are doing when they go to these people, these observers of times and enchanters and prognosticators, they're looking for some extra truth, some extra wisdom. They're looking for some knowledge, right? Some knowledge they get that's otherworldly, supernatural information. And he's saying, no, don't go to these sources. Don't go into this darkness. Don't go into this wickedness and become an abomination. He says, why? Because I'm going to send you the prophet. Because I'm going to give you the light. I'm going to give you the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ. There is a prophet. I am giving you the truth and the information you need to have. Don't get involved in this nonsense. And look, this is the very reason why, you know, I don't believe any Christian should be going out and watching these movies with these wizards like the Harry Potters and the Lord of the Rings and all the stuff that gets into this exact type of abomination. Why are you putting abomination in front of your eyes? 
Hollywood wants to glamorize this. It's exciting for the kids to see, oh, wow, here's a magic wand, and he could do this and do that and cause things to change into whatever he wants and have all this power. And it's wickedness, and it's abomination, and you shouldn't have anything to do with it. Parents, make sure you're not letting your kids get this up, and kids, you know, when other people are into this stuff, have nothing to do with it. It's abominable. The Bible puts the death penalty on the witches. The Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. It's that serious. Oh, well, we're just playing around a little bit. Don't play around with that stuff. I played around with the Ouija board when I was a kid. I'll tell you what, it's real. A lot of people try to tell you, I remember I was a kid, oh, it's fake. Oh, people pushing stuff. This stuff's real. It's not anything that you, you, you'd want to get involved with at all. You don't want to get involved with the, the satanic forces that are out there. And we, th this stuff is just as real as you see here, just as there's good angels that are here to defend and to help out and to be ministers, ministering spirits like they were here, ministering to Elisha, ministering to his servant, Make, keeping them protected, having legions of angels. Jesus Christ said, you know, don't you know that I could ask my father right now and he could send me 12 legions of angels? Like he had the power to call down angels and they were real beings and it really would have happened because it's reality. This stuff is real. Don't, don't, you know, like I said, don't let the people that are the charlatans make you think it's all fake. And just because a lot of, you know, because we know that there's reality, that doesn't make it all real either. But real or fake, you should have nothing to do with any of it because it's all wickedness. It's all abominable. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We need to be armored up and suited up because there is a battle going on against the devil. And the next verse says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is spiritual wickedness, not just physical. There's physical wickedness, wickedness in high places, no doubt. But behind the physical person in the high places is spiritual wickedness. The human vessels are pawns in the devil's game. They're puppets. You know, people are looking at the New World Order and, the, and, and who's behind all these things. And, you know, some people just say it's all the Jews, it's all the Catholic Church. It's all, they're all pawns of Satan. All of them are. The Rothschilds, you know, whoever it is, all these wicked people and wicked groups and wicked organizations, they're all being used. Um, that doesn't take away from their own personal wickedness. But there is spiritual wickedness in high places. There are spiritual forces at work, and we need to be ready for them. We need, that's why we need to have the armor of God. We need to have the truth of the Bible. We need to have faith. We need to have all the things that we need in order to be able to stand. Angels are all around us. They come and go between the earth and heaven. We see that in Job. We see that when, when God's speaking with Satan and he says, you know, whence comest thou? So from going about to and fro throughout the earth, he's, he presented himself among the sons of God. And then um, in Genesis 28, we had the story of Jacob. 28, 12, the Bible says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Jacob sees this vision of angels going up and down between earth and heaven. Genesis 32, 1 says, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Hebrews 13, 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. They're real beings. Over and over again, you see a lot written about angels. And there's a lot written about devils, too. We need to remember that they're real. And that's why I don't discount people have stories. You know, there's a lot of people have stories of like alien sightings and ghost sightings and, you know, all these other things that happen. 
Are some of them fake? Sure, I'm sure a lot of them are fake. But I don't think they all are, but I think what they're seeing, they don't understand what it is they're actually seeing. I think a lot of people are seeing devils at work and, and doing devilish things, whatever it is, you know, and, and messing with people. And, uh, and, a lot, and some of those things are real because I know that angels are real. And I know that sometimes people are able to see those angels. And it's not normal to be able to see the angels and whatever they're doing. Turn if you go to Daniel chapter 10. But what we can take comfort in, definitely from this story especially, is that they do exist. And that even when everything else around us looks like there's no hope, it looks like there's no way to, to beat the odds here. God's there to help. And you know, I think in many instances, especially in Israel's history, when you had great kings who were actually listening to the word of God, and they were relying on God to win battles for them, there's different ways that God gave them the victory. You know, sometimes we, we saw the one where they saw the water, they thought it was blood, and then they ran in and they ended up killing each other, fighting, and, you know, all these various things happen. Or they run into the camp and, and they're just ready to, to kill them there because they weren't ready to fight. You know, all these various things, they hear the sound of horses and, and they run away scared because they think they hired someone else. God has multiple ways to, to, to bring the victory for who he wants to bring the victory. But I think another one of those ways is when they just, when he uses the angels and sends angels down and do some of the fighting for them and helping them out and protecting them, which is why it says in some of the big battles, they lost like nobody. In the early battles when they're going in to take over the promised land and it's like, they had a, a, a slaughter where they won completely and like nobody died. Why? I believe because the angels were there helping out and protecting and making sure that nobody was going to get hurt. It's a reality. Daniel, um, Daniel 10 gives another example of an angel going to speak with Daniel. Daniel's praying unto God. He's asking for wisdom and understanding and he's, you know, confessing sins and he's just, you know, he's just really uh, trying to get a hold of God. And um, in Daniel 10, we see another, another situation here. Verse 12, the Bible says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king's of Persia. This is really interesting because this is talking about a spiritual battle that was going on because an angel came to talk to Daniel. And he said, the reason why he didn't come earlier, it's at the verse number 14 says, now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall that people in latter days, for yet the vision for many days. He, he came to, to go to talk to Daniel like right away. But there was other battles going on that needed to be fought and, and delayed his even coming to, to go and speak to Daniel. And you notice that in verse 13, it uses the word prince, the prince of the kingdom. Spiritually speaking, it's not talking about the physical king or the physical prince of the kingdom of Persia. It's talking about the, the underlying spiritual force behind the king of Persia. That prince, that rule, the one who's, who's really directing the evil influence over that king in Persia while you have them fighting with the good influences with like Michael, the archangel, coming to help out. And for the angel then being able to come and, and speak to Daniel because there's a spiritual battle going on that our eyes can't see, but we know that God's word is true and by faith we understand that these things are true and these things are happening. And it's something to, to be aware of. And, and even, you know, in our worst time when everything seems to be going wrong around you, remember that. And especially if you're faced with physical problems or what, you know, physical hurt, physical injury. Something's bad happening. You know, people, you hear the stories, and I, and I believe in many cases, it's, you know, it's not just a coincidence, you know, people almost dying in car wrecks or things like that happen. I mean, I've had things happen in my own life where I was inches away from my head being splattered. Now, I don't know for a fact if an angel helped in those situations or not, but it's definitely possible. And in some cases, I think entirely true. 
We just don't always know. In Acts chapter 12, I'm, I'll read this for you. Um, just go back to 2 Kings 6. There's another story. I mean, there's so many stories of angels and the reality of them. I mean, it's, it, you have to just pretty much deny the Bible to deny that these things exist and that the angels exist and that they actually have influence and impact on our world and, and what goes on in our physical world. Acts 12 is when Peter was arrested and he was in prison, right? And you got the whole church praying for him. And I'll just read this for you. It says in, uh, in verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. God sent his angel to, to do a prison break for Peter. I mean, he's bound in chains in a cell between two soldiers. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? But the angel came through, chains came off, opened up all the doors to the prison and let him out. And see, with the ability of angels to do that, that's another reason why I think, you know, again, I know a lot of this stuff is fake, but the, the, the people who think that there's ghosts and hauntings, I think there's evil spirits that are able to manipulate, uh, you know, to some level, physical things that happen. And that's a scary thing. And the people that, that I've been, that I've heard from stories that, in my opinion, are the most believable people that I actually know, almost every single time, there's been some connection or someone in their family that was into witchcraft, that was into the psychics and into the, you know, the Ouija boards and into this other stuff. And it's not a coincidence. I know two people specifically that I trust and I believe the things that they say they experienced. And look, I'm a big skeptic on this stuff. Believe me, I am. But some things... I mean, we have enough evidence in the Bible to know that, that angels are real and just as much we know that those devils are real. But the good news for us is that angels are real and we could rely on them for our protection and for, to get us out of any, you know, the most impossible situations to never lose that faith or hope in the Lord because nothing is too hard for the Lord, no matter where you find yourself. And we're going to be facing, I believe very sincerely, probably in my lifetime, that we're going to be facing some very serious persecutions and troubles and things like that. Now, God's going to allow us to go through a lot of those things and it's going to happen, but I also know that God is able to deliver out of those things just as easily. And so the key is fear not. Whatever God has in store for you, he has in store for you, but don't ever be afraid of it because if you're doing what's right, you have zero reason to fear. No reason to fear. And if he's going to allow you to be martyred, then you know, rejoice over that. But be confident. I would always be confident. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and I go, you know what? The Lord's able to deliver us. And we're trusting in him. But even if he chooses not to, hey, we're not going to do what's wrong anyways. We're not going to say, we're not going to bow down. We're still going to do what's right. That's the right attitude to have. Of just knowing wholeheartedly, hey, God could send 12 legions of angels right now and deliver me. And if he chooses not to do that, that's fine. But I'm still going to do what's right, and you're not going to scare me into doing what's wrong. Because that's what, what's what the Satan wants to do and what the world wants to do, is try to shut you down and shut down the message. Let's keep going here. Verse number 18, 2 Kings chapter 6. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. We need to get it through our heads also. When you're living righteously, like Elisha was, and you know, a man of God, he had God's ear. And there, he's not the only one. 
There have been other men of God that have prayed to God to just do things that you probably normally wouldn't ever even think to ask God to do because you just think it's impossible. We need to get it out of our head, this idea of anything being impossible, and just pray what you need. Believing you're going to get, you know, you're going to receive what you're, what you're praying for and just making sure you're in God's good graces, that, he's, that you're being a good child and that he's going to listen to you. God wants to do these things. But God didn't come up with this to smite them with blindness. Elisha did. Elisha sees the situation. He's got all the angels. He knows he's protected. But then he goes, hey, God, can you smite him with blindness? God heard him. Okay, yeah, I will do that. He could have done all kinds of different things. I mean, he had the angels there. He could have, he could have probably had fire come down from heaven and destroyed them all. If he asked them for it, he asked for blindness. And God listened to him. Look at verse 19. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. So this was the ultimate Jedi mind trick that he pulled on them because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the force that he used, that the wickedness of, you know, of, of what that film's all about. This was actually the, the true power of God being able to show them, you know, to be able to, to, to blind them and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, hey, this isn't the right city. This isn't, you know, this isn't, I'll lead you guys the right way. Come with me because they're all blind. They need someone to lead them by the hand. So he leads them, come with me, come here. So he brings them like into the heart of Samaria, which is the capital city of Israel, Right? right into the, to the lion's den, as it were. And their, their defenses are completely down. They're completely defenseless as they enter into the city. So he leads them into Samaria. And then when they're in Samaria, God, you know, he's like, hey, God, open up their eyes now. Right? It's like, surprise, here you are. <laughs> We're in the middle of the city, Samaria. And verse 21, he says, And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, When he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Now look at the attitude. This is important that the king of Israel has with Elisha at this moment. Why? Because up to this point, he was listening to Elisha, and Elisha was, you know, keeping, a, you know, doing the, you know, letting him know when there was traps and everything else. So he's looking to Elisha now for the guidance. Hey, what should I do? You brought him here. What should we do? Should we kill him? Should I smite him? Verse 22, and he answered, thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast ca taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. This is extremely important lesson to learn for Christians in America today. Because within the past decade or so, the, the, the nation has lost its integrity and understanding what's right when dealing with prisoners of war. Elisha gives them the simple truth here of just saying, look, you know, he's saying, oh, should, I, should, we, should we kill him? Should we kill him? I mean, you got them all right here, right? It's like shooting ducks in a barrel. He says, no. Just because I got them here by the power of God and they were blind and we brought them in, what, what would you do if you had taken them captive? That's what he asks them. If you would have taken them captive with, you know, with your sword and bow and whatever prisoners you take, what are you going to do for them? Well, apparently we know what he would have done for them because they had integrity. So, no, feed them. Give them food and drink. Take care of them. They're captive, but take care of them. We live in a country now that says, let's waterboard them. Let's torture them and get whatever information we can out of them. And that's wicked. That is not right. And there was a time when America used to stand for what's right. You know, there's a time when, when in this country when people believed that the rights that we have were given to us by our creator. Now people want to say, oh, we can look at every other nation in this world and they don't have any rights because they're not an American. Uh, no, that's not what this country was founded on. That's not the principle of the, of the documents that supposedly are the ones that created this country. It's recognizing that all men are created equal. It recognizes that we're endued by, with human rights from God. And it's not just because we live on this piece of land in North America. It's because we're human beings that everybody has these rights. Everybody has the right to, to you know, 
pursue their dreams and to not be, um, you know, all the, all the rights that are spelled out. To defend yourself. To speak your mind. Everybody has those rights given to them by God. Some people are oppressed by wicked people and power that are oppressing them. Yeah. But that doesn't mean just because, oh, you're not a United States citizen. You know, people want to say, oh, the, you know, the illegal immigrants that come into this country, you don't have rights. Well, yeah, they still have human rights because they're people. Because God gave them those rights, not some stupid piece of paper. Not some government. Your rights that you have today, the right that I have to carry my firearm on my hip, it's not because the government is giving me that right. It's because God's given me the right to defend myself and to carry a sword. Regardless of what the government says. Now, we may fall into oppression to where there's going to be people trying to take away the rights that God has given you. But everybody in the world has this right given to them by God. That's a fact, and people need to get that through their heads. And this falls into the attitude of, you know what? You treat your enemies the way that you would like to be treated. I mean, what if you were to be taken captive? It was always looked down upon in this country when people would be tortured. I mean, what happened in Vietnam? You know, the reason why you have the POWMIA flags, the prisoners of war, missing in action, those guys that never forget, right? That are, that are in these concentration camps and the torture that was done to them and how wicked that is. And people have all the sympathy in the world for people that get stuck in those camps, yet some of the same people want to turn around and do the same thing to other countries, to other people that we take prisoners. It's wickedness. It's wicked for them to do it. It's wicked for us to do it. I don't care what, what flag you're flying. It's all wickedness. You don't torture people. The, if you believe the Bible, then you ought to read 2 Kings chapter 6 and see what Elisha, the man of God, had to say about how you treat prisoners of war. Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. This is the righteous way to deal with the prisoners of war. They didn't waterboard them. And even, you know, now it's like you hear these things at Abu Ghraib of them like sodomizing people. And having their children watch and all the sick, perverted filth that United States military has been involved in. That's come out publicly. Video recording the torture that they were doing. Sodomy. And force them to do weird things with kids. And it, I mean, what have we become as a nation? It's gut wrenching. It's disgusting. You think God's going to bless that? Hell no. God's going to rain a hellfire and brimstone on the country doing that stuff. That is wicked. We've got to remember this concept of how we deal with our enemies. This is in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. I mean, this is Old Testament. People want to think that the Old Testament is all so hard and you're supposed to hate your enemies. You know, when Jesus said, you've heard it been said, hate thine enemy, he's not quoting the Bible. He's quoting a saying, you've heard it been said. Because that's not found in the Bible. Because in the Old Testament, we have here in 2 Kings chapter 6 what Elisha said. We have in Proverbs 25, verse 21, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. This is quoted basically in Romans 12, also in the New Testament. Verse 9 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. 
Look, God will take care of the vengeance. You do what's right. You live the good example. That's why he says in verse 21 of Romans 12, you might want to mark this or highlight this or memorize this. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the way that we overcome evil. Even if, so, if you're involved in a defensive battle and they're taking prisoners and they're treating them wickedly and doing all kinds of horrible things to them, you don't turn and do the same things that they're doing with, to their prisoners. You still do what's right. You overcome the evil with good. You treat them the way that, they ought, that you ought to treat a human being in those situations. But you don't, you don't sink down to their level. When, someone, when your enemy is doing evil to you, you don't sink to the level of your enemy. You hold yourself in integrity and in the word of God and you just do what's right. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. But see, people don't like to hear that. And, here, and here's the problem. We're going to see this right in this story. Elisha told him to do what's right. And he did. And you know what? They ended up letting him go. And this is, this is where the torture people get all excited. Oh, you let them go. Now they're going to, you know, they did what was right. But here's, look at what happens. Verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. This is a great famine. So what happened is, you know, time goes by and then they come back and they besiege Samaria. So Syria comes, they, they environ the city round about, no, one, no supplies could come in or go out, and they're, they're just sitting tight and, and kind of waiting until they, they die or they, you know, surrender. Because what happens is when there's no supplies coming in or out, people start to starve. That's why there's a famine and this famine was so bad within the city at this point that it says here the fourth part. So if you divide it, I don't know what a, how big a cab is, but you know how big a dove is and how much dung you get out of a dove is not very much. So I don't think a cab is a large unit of measure here. Divided into four parts, people were eating the dung for, for sustenance because the famine was so bad and that that was selling for five pieces of silver. Think about like a hundred bucks in an in, in hour, if a piece of silver is like an ounce. In today's, you know, roughly, you know, somewhere around a hundred dollars for a fourth part of a, of a cab of dove's dung. It's very serious famine. So because this happens now, this is where the people want to say, see, we should have tortured them. We should have killed them. We should have done what was wrong because now they came back and did wrong to us. And this is where they want to have their argument of saying, shouldn't have done that. But we have to live by faith and integrity. There's another reason why this happened. Why, why they besieged Samaria. It's because they weren't being righteous. Now, they did the right thing in that one instance. But Israel was, being, was still living wickedly. And we know this because um, later in the story, and this is, I, I, I personally, I don't like reading this story because of what happens. When the king of Israel is on the wall, it says in verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? out of the barn floor, out, out of the wine press. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. This story of how bad the famine was, that they were willing to eat their own children, I mean, it, it, it's, it's stomach-churning. It's horrible to think about, but this shows you just how bad of condition they were in. But the Bible, and, I, and I didn't get this in my notes, so I don't have the reference, 
But the Bible tells us that when, you're, when, when the children of Israel, when the covenant they made with God, when they go into extreme wickedness, that this is going to be one of the curses that comes upon them, that they're going to eat their own children. And that's what happened here. And we know that this is, you know, especially during this time period, the people were, were, were still very wicked. You had a great man of God and Elijah and Elisha following up, but still the people were, were just given over to idolatry and all kinds of bad things. And this king was a wicked king too. I mean, yeah, he listened to the man of God a few times when it benefited him. But we're going to see how, how that turns out too and how he turns on the man of God when things aren't going well, right? It's the, the prosperity following. Oh, when things are going great, then yeah, the man of God's great. But when things are going bad, then it's all the man of God's fault instead of his fault or the people's fault. We can't use, you know, all these situa you know, have situational ethics of just, well, when things work out, well, we tried to do things right the way the Bible says and not torture them and, you know, give them food and water and send them away, but see what that did for us? So now let's just sink down to the lowest level and just do all manner of wickedness. That is not how we operate as Christians. It's not the way we're supposed to operate. We, live, we have to live by faith and integrity. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 73. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. It's not the things that we see around us. We walk by faith. We walk by the words of the Lord. And if God says to do something a certain way, we're going to do it. And if something doesn't seem to work out the way that you think it should, we're still going to walk by faith and by the words of God. Because in the end, we know that, it's, that it'll work out the way that, that it's supposed to. You can't judge things, especially off of the short term. And that's what, when you're just going off of your sight, all kinds of things happen between the beginning and the end that could throw off your faith. We have to continue to walk by faith, not by sight. It says, for we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, there is a judgment coming. Whatever you think is happening in this short term, the way that you live your life, if you're saved, you're going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. So you're going to receive a reward for the things that you did, which is why you live by integrity and by faith and not by sight. Because if you think, oh, well, if I do what's right here, it may not work out for me in the short run. Yeah, but if you do what's right here, it's going to work out for you in the long run when you're standing before Jesus Christ and you can say with a pure heart, I did what you told me to do. I lived an upright life. I lived with integrity according to your word. Even, when, even if the, the bad guy is going to come back time and time again, I'm going to, I went and I overcame evil with good. Because that's what you told me to do. I don't care if it, if it didn't seem to work out for someone else. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. And there is a judgment seat of Christ that's going to happen. Don't be deceived by the short-term results when you're doing what's right. Because in the short term, you're going to have a lot of trials and tribulations. You're going to have persecutions. You know, people like to, people, this happens all the time. People will go to a church and they'll judge whether or not they think they should be going to that church within like a week of just based on external circumstances. You know, someone might come to church and visit for this first time. They kind of like it. And then the next week they're going to come and they get a flat tire and, oh, this must be a sign from God. I shouldn't be going to this church and just completely misinterpreting what's happening and just basing off of just random things or not even necessarily random. Maybe, maybe this is the church you're supposed to be going to and the devil's keeping you from coming. You know, but people do all kinds of weird things or maybe you just got a flat. <laughs> maybe that's it. And you shouldn't just be reading into every little thing that happens. We can't be focused on the short term and on, on, and on a lot of these things and just as much, don't be deceived by the riches of the wicked. So a very similar situation in, in Psalm 73. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, For I was envious 
at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And this, is, this turns a lot of people off too. Say, well, why should I be doing what's right? Every time I try to do what's right, you know, bad things seem to happen. I seem to have a hard time. Things don't seem to go my way. But look at the Hollywood actors. Look at the movie stars. Look at the music stars. Look at all these people that are really wicked and everything seems to be going their way. They've got all the money. They've got all the fame. They've got all the stuff. So why should I even bother doing what's right? Why don't I just go have fun and party and live it up and just get all this stuff? This is, this is what the psalmist is saying here in Psalm 73. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. He said, even when they die, it doesn't, you know, doesn't seem that bad. It seems they still have their strength. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. They don't lift up in pride because nothing bad happened to them. You know, they're all full of themselves. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They've got everything they could ever ask for. Looks great, doesn't it? They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. And, and he's bringing all this stuff up because he's saying, well, I don't see anything happening to them. They're not doing anything like they're supposed to be doing. They have everything. And in fact, it's the exact opposite. They have everything they could ever want. Verse 9, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. So he's comparing now himself to them. They've got it all. But all day long, I'm plagued. I'm chastened every morning. Verse 15, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. There is an end. You can't rely on just looking at the short term to determine your morality and how you're going to live your life because if you do that, you can be deceived by the wicked. The wicked have everything in this lifetime. Everything's going for them. They're living in sin. They're living in wickedness. They're, they're blasphemous against God. They're lifted up in pride. All the things the Bible says not to do. And then, they, and then when they die, some of them die in an old age. Some of them seem to have their strength all the way until the day they die. So what's the problem? Oh, wait. Because then I understood their end, that they split hell wide open. And that's where they're going to be burning and tortured and tormented forever. It's not all it's cracked up to be, is it? Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm almost done. I'm going to close with this here, this last point, because... We just, uh, I told you a story here. We read that part about the, the eating the children. I believe all of this was brought on themselves from being wicked and unto God. They could have gotten right with God after they were delivered the first time. Because the first time they got out easy. God kept watching them and protecting them and protecting them. You see, they weren't getting right with God. I think they were getting lofty. Ha, ha, ha. They can't touch us and getting full of themselves instead of going, wow, what an awesome God is able to protect us. We ought to humble ourselves and just serve the Lord and, and know that he can keep us safe from these things. Because those same angels he could have sent to defend them and to, and to call off the siege on the city so they didn't even have to go through all this suffering. But he didn't. Now he does end up delivering them still. But look at the king's attitude. I want to point this out because before the king was like, Master, what shall we do when, he, when everything seemed to be going well for him? But now this happens. And the king hears about this, you know, this horrible story about, about these women eating their children. 
It says in verse 30, And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Now, he had sackcloth within. Notice, he was trying to humble himself, but he didn't let anybody see. And this is kind of the heart of the king. When people humbled themselves, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes, right? That's how they, how they mourn. That's how they would be humbling themselves before God. The only reason they even knew that he had that on is because he rent his clothes. So on the outside, he didn't have the sackcloth. And why didn't he just have it on to begin with? Why didn't, why didn't he just humble himself? Why did he have to do it privately? But then look what he says in verse 31. Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. So he's basically saying, I'm going to kill Elisha. I'm going to cut off his head. Why? It's all Elisha's fault, right? Yeah, it's all that prophet's fault. Yeah, the same prophet that helped you out and told you, hey, don't go here because you're going to be ambushed. All of a sudden, he's just, he's just against me for some reason. No, you're against yourself. No, God's against you. It's not Elisha. Verse 32, But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head. He's talking about the son of Ahab. Ahab is a murderer. He says, The son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head. Look when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. So he's saying when the messenger comes, you know, lock him in here, close him up because the, uh, the king is going to come right behind him. The king loved it when Elisha was saving the king and the people tell him the Syrians were there. But then he gets his unrighteous anger against Elisha, blaming him for the siege, blaming him for what's going wrong now. And you know, this is the fair weather Christian when things are going well in their life and they're, they're in church, they're, oh, hallelujah, praise God, everything's going great, right? And they're coming to church and they love the pastor and they love the, you know, everything that's going on and then something bad happens and then it's blame God. And then it's, oh, blame the, blame the pastor, blame the preacher, blame everybody but yourself. Having that wicked attitude and that wicked heart. Be careful not to have a bad or bitter attitude against God ever. It's not God's fault. God doesn't cause you to go through things for your, you know, for your hurt or for like to, because he hates you. God doesn't cause evil, you know, like specifically upon you unless you've brought it on yourself. God loves you. He wants what's best for you. In the last verse here, verse 33, and while he yet talked with them, Behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? And we're going to, we're going to pick up next week because the story continues into chapter 7. And we're going, to, we're going to go jump back probably a verse or two here when we start next week to, to get the context of the story again. I'm not going to preach any more on, on that last verse because it, it just carries into the next chapter. But... Um, a lot to learn. I love, man, I love these stories with Elisha. There's so much stuff going on here. But um, at the end of the day, we need, to, we need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves humble, that we know that, these, uh, that the angels are real, man. They're, it's a real thing. And, and we could have comfort knowing that when we're doing what's right, God's able to deliver us from anything. And if the people have been doing right, I don't even think this siege would have happened. But they brought it on themselves. And, and here's the other thing, too. I mean, Finally, that's a, it's a pretty disturbing story about eating children. But remember also that that is a plague and that is a curse that comes from God. So when people think that, oh, it's God, God doesn't see anything, God doesn't care, and they get all flippant about God's rules and just thinking they could go off into all kinds of sin, that's a pretty low end result to be at as a curse from just disregarding God's commands and just getting off into sin. Keep that in your mind as well. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, dear God, and for the instruction and the warnings and everything that we can learn from the Bible, dear Lord. I pray that you please just um, help us to have more faith, help us to, to walk by faith and not by sight, dear Lord. 
and that we wouldn't look at the short-term events, but that we would consider the end of a thing and know that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, dear Lord. Help us to walk in integrity and wisdom and knowledge, dear Lord, and that you'd open up our understanding. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.